Hello my friend, our topic is about the mark of the beast and the seal of God forever marked. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we humbly come to you Lord. We ask that you cleanse us from all our sins. We ask that you give us the Holy Spirit to enlighten your word Lord. Help us to understand your word so that we may pattern our lives according to your word so that we might not be lost. I pray for the listeners and the viewers, Lord. Give them wisdom and understanding to determine what is in the Bible. And thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This very important and very interesting topic, my friends, let's go ahead. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a strange dream. He saw a great metal image. When he awoke, he wasn't able to remember what it was. But Daniel revealed to him not only the dream, but its meaning as well. Nebuchadnezzar was flattered. After all, he was represented by the gleaming head of gold. His kingdom stood unrivaled in the world. But Nebuchadnezzar's delight at Daniel's revealing of the dream was short-lived as he realized that another metal followed gold. His kingdom would be replaced. In defiance, he ordered a statue made like one that he had dreamed about, except he instructed it to be made entirely of gold from head to toe. It was the king's way of defying the prophecy and asserting that his kingdom would be the one to last forever. On an appointed day, thousands of important dignitaries in the king's empire assembled to witness the dedication of Nebuchadnezzar's version of the image. A spokesman for the king instructed that when the music began to play, all were to bow down and worship the image the king had set up. Those who refused to worship would be thrown into a fiery furnace. Recognizing the three men as talented, intelligent, and extraordinary leaders in his empire, the king decided to give them another chance. Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of all the music and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, then good. But if you do not worship, you will be cast to the immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Daniel 3.15 Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could no doubt see the roaring flames of the furnace. There was no reason to doubt the king's resolve. What should they do? Of course, they knew that God, what God said about the situation, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. Exodus 20, 4 and 5. Should they obey the king and live or obey God and die? They could have rationalized. They could have found an excuse. After all, their lives were on the line. But they didn't. You see, these three Hebrews weren't just followers of a religion with creeds and teachings and beliefs. No, their religion was a personal relationship with God of heaven. They knew him to be the creator and sustainer of all things. They had trusted his guiding hand and found him to be trustworthy. Even as exiles in Babylon, they had grown to love and trust him. They knew that when that he was able to do what he had promised to do, they knew that this life is not the end of the story, but that God, that the God they loved would return one day to establish an eternal kingdom just like the real one, the real dream Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2 had predicted. Because they knew and loved their God, the all-powerful and trustworthy king of eternity, they didn't hesitate 
to answer Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel 3, 16 to 18, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the cause, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. Daniel 3, 16 to 18. King Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be bound and thrown into the furnace. The fire was so intense that the soldiers who threw the three young men into the furnace fell back dead. Incredibly enough, as we will see shortly, the Bible tells us that God protected the lives of these three young men in a miraculous way. But did you know that this story is used as a template for another great test still to come for God's people? In the book of Revelation, the prophet John uses the imagery from Daniel chapter 3 to describe what is going to happen at the very end of time. Like the Hebrews, the three Hebrews, everyone living during the earth's last hours will be faced with a similar choice. Will you obey man's requirements and live or obey God and face death? Once again, there will be a counterfeit, an image, a decision regarding worship, and a life and death choice to be made. Listen to Revelation's urgent warning. In Revelation 14, 9 and 10, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead and on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Revelation 14, 9 and 10. According to Bible prophecy, at the end of time, very end of time, Earth's inhabitants will be divided according to whom they obey. Those who love and trust God and keep His commandments, and those who worship the beast and receive His approval or mark. Notice how intense the pressure will be. Revelation 13, 16, 17, He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads and none that no, no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name revelation 13 16 17. eventually a decree will be passed condemning to death those who obey god and refuse to worship the beast and his image he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image should, of the beast should, be, should both speak and cause as many as would not to worship the image of the beast, to be killed, Revelation 13, 15. So once again, God's followers will have to make the decision, this decision. If we don't worship the beast and his image, this world will not do business with us and eventually kill us. But if we do worship the beast, he, we will experience the anger and destruction of the God of heaven. Now, some will find this warning in scripture, and especially the idea of God's anger being poured out on the disobedient as being unloving. But is it unloving? You see, what motivated Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to risk their lives in obedience to God was their love for him. Their belief in His promises and their trust in His word. Love is not just a happy emotion. It is a principle which guides the decision of those who are in a relationship with someone they trust. But here's the thing. You can't trust someone who isn't fair and just. We might be tempted to equate love and mercy. If we do, we would find God's warning about the destruction of the disobedient to be unloving. We might be tempted to be great love and mercy. If we do, we would find God's warning about the destruction of the disobedient to be unloving. But God, love is much more 
grand mercy. Love is the harmonious, simultaneous blending of mercy and justice. Love is what happened on Calvary. This is love. On Calvary's cross. When justice, the wages of sin is death, and met mercy, Christ died in our place. Before you conclude that God's warning about the wrath of God being poured out on the disobedient is unloving, you should consider that Jesus, the Creator Himself, already experienced the wrath of God in our place so that we don't have to. That is love. And a loving God would never allow the world to be deceived into the popular false worship of the last days without a warning. In the book of Revelation, we find clues to understanding what the beast is and how it will counterfeit the worship of God. The disciple John wrote in Revelation 13, 1 and 2, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and seven horns, and on his horn ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which was like a leopard, his feet, were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. What could such a beast symbolize? Daniel 7 taught us that beasts represent ruling powers. And this beast in Revelation 13 is made up of parts of all the four of Daniel's great beasts. It inherits characteristics of all the four of those great M-world empires. Speaking of this beast, John wrote, Revelation 13, 2, The dragon gave him his power, its power. The dragon gave him, is, the dragon gave him his power and great, his throne and great authority. The term dragon in Revelation refers to Satan. And the great dreadful beast or empire he worked through Rome. Speaking of the devil's attempt to kill Jesus soon after his birth, Revelation says, And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Revelation 12, 4. Of course, it was the Roman ruler, Herod, whom Satan used to try to accomplish this. Herod decreed, decreed that all male infants in Bethlehem up to the age of two, should be killed. Baby Jesus narrowly escaped Bethlehem's tragic bloodshed. The prophecy further predicted that this same power, pagan Rome, would give its power and his throne and great authority to the beast. Did pagan Rome fulfill this prediction? If so, to whom was it given? In AD 330, the Roman Emperor Constantine moved his capital from Rome to Byzantium and changed his, the name of Byzantium to Constantinople. Upon leaving Rome, he gave his seat to the Bishop of Rome, also known as the Pope. The Pope thus became the head of the church as well as the de facto civil ruler of the Western Roman Empire. A union of church and state resulted in the church ruling over the state. Vatican City lies in the middle of Rome, the city that was the seat of the old Roman Empire. The Roman Church continues there even today, not only as a religious power, but as a political power as well. Nearly every nation sends ambassadors to the Vatican. Of course, the prophecy here is identifying an organization, system, or system of theology, not an individual. There are many sincere people who worship God in every religion, but do not yet know what you are learning today about Bible prophecy. A close study of the identifying marks of the first power, beast power in Revelation 13, makes it clear that it is the same power that was symbolized by the little horn of Daniel 7, which we have already studied. It is this power that the prophet John saw would try to force its distinguishing mark upon everyone in the world. 
Revelation 13, 16, 17, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on His right hand and on His foreheads, and that no one would buy and sell except that one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of His name. Those who are thus marked by obedience to this church state union, church state union, are contrasted in Revelation with those who do not receive the mark. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. The great issue to which this world is heading will center on trusting God and keeping His commandments. One group receives the mark of the beast, while the other is loyal and true to God by keeping all His commandments and maintaining the faith of Jesus Christ. Those who love and trust Jesus enough to obey Him, even if it incurs the wrath of human leaders and institutions, will also receive a mark. But it will be God's mark, God's seal. Revelation 7, 2 and 3. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the sea and the earth, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Revelation 2.7.20 I want that seal, don't you? Nothing is more important than the seal of God. The final conflict of the world history is over the seal of God versus the mark of the beast. It's between the sign of obedience and a counterfeit sign. If we clearly understand God's seal or mark, it will be easy to discover the counterfeit mark that the church state will enforce. God tells us what his sign is. Ezekiel 20, 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me. And God again says, Exodus 31, 13. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths shall ye keep for it is a sign between me and you throughout all your generations. A sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord your God who sanctifies you. Exodus 31, 13. God clearly identified obeying him in keeping of the Sabbath as the sign of allegiance to him. What does the Roman church power say? is the mark of their authority? The following quotation is taken from the Catholic Catechism. Question, how do you prove that the church hath power to command feasts and holidays? Answer, by the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which the Protestants allow of, and therefore they fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most of other feasts commanded by the church. Question, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals or precepts? Answer, had she not had power, she could have not substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day. A change for which there is no scriptural authority. An abridgment of the Christian doctrine by Henry Tuberville, page 58. Sunday, mar worship is the mark of the Roman Church's religious authority. According to her own testimony, she readily admits that she changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. And further, she says that this is the act, that this act is the mark of her ecclesiastes, ecclesiastical power and authority. Letter from C. F. Thomas, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons, October 28, 1859, 1895. <clears throat> the Roman Church challenges Protestants to show why they have desecrated God's day and changes and turned from the biblical Sabbath to follow a day that was instituted by custom tradition in the Church of Rome. <clears throat> Remember that Daniel predicted that this beast would, this power would think 
to change times and laws. Daniel 7, 25. He also predicted that it would cast the truth down to the ground. Daniel 8, 12. Yes, my friend. Gender Revelator is seeing the same power that Daniel of old had written about. John sees a time in the future when again there will be coerced religion and forced worship. Only this time it will not be a counterfeit image on the plain of Dura. It will be a requirement to worship on a counterfeit day. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 16, 17. In order for this power to fulfill every aspect of this prophecy, it will have to use the power of civil government to enforce its mark of authority. In the Middle Ages, a union between church and state existed and his power will create a replica. This power will create a replica in the last days of the replica of the medieval union. Notice another identifying sign. Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who understands calculate the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man. His number is 666. Revelation 13, 18. Perhaps one more than any other kingdom more than any other kingdom in history, the Roman Church has been represented by one person or position, one office. The chief pontiff or ruler of the Church of Pope of Rome. Again, we must be clear, the Bible here is speaking about a system, an office, and not about an individual person. One of the Pope's titles is Vicarius Filii Dei, meaning vicar of the son of god in biblical world letters had numerical value as well for example we still refer to roman numerals as a way of writing numbers with letters if we tally the numerical values of the pope's title we find yet another confirmation of this power look at the image uh, look at the picture eh? you add all the numbers it is the number of his name it is the number of the Pope's name, Vicarius Philidae. <clears throat> now, of course, by this by itself doesn't prove the papacy to be the subject of this prophecy. But with all other unmistakable clues, previews, it adds to the certainty of our conclusion. We can see that the time is coming in that not too distant future when everyone will be required to keep the first day of the week in direct violation of the commandment of God. A question that many people ask is, does anyone have the mark of the beast now? The answer is no. No one has the mark of the beast yet. When the mark of the beast is enforced by civil law, every person must then choose between allegiance to God by keeping the Sabbath according to the commandments of God or allegiance to the church state beast by keeping the day substituted by human authority. Then, and only then, will anyone receive the mark of the beast. To every soul will come the crucial test. Will I obey God or human authorities? And this is not just a matter of a day or a week of the week. It is a matter of who is the master of your heart and life. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God will have a people living on planet earth in the last days who will be willing to stare the threat of persecution and death in the face without hesitation or wavering. They will be willing to love, be willing to lovingly obey the Creator God because they have come to know Him as a God of love, the same God who perfectly blended mercy and justice in Jesus who died in their place. They are be willing to faithfully serve him because they know that they can trust him completely. He is the one who will set up that eternal kingdom 
and the one in, and who invites us to be part of that eternal kingdom. They will obey him out of love and admiration and appreciation for the great salvation he has provided them. They know that his word will never fail and his promises will always be true. They may not be able to buy and sell if they refuse to receive the beast's mark, but their God promises bread and water, bread will be given him and water shall be sure, Isaiah 33, 16. And when God's anger is poured out in the seven last plagues, they know his promise will not fail. Psalm 91, 5 to 11. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall on your side and ten thousand on your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near to your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Psalm 91, 5 to 11. God isn't going to abandon those who are loving and serving him. At the time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands Watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation, even to that time. And at the time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Daniel 12, verse 1. Remember the story of Daniel's three friends in Babylon? For obeying God's commandments instead of human instructions, those three young men were thrown into the fiery furnace. The heat was so severe, it even killed the soldiers who were thrown, throwing them into the flames. Nebuchadnezzar must have had confidence that the men who had defied the worship of the image, the sign of his authority, were certainly destroyed. But it was not so, because the God that the Hebrews trusted, the one they loved, and had a personal relationship with, wasn't going to abandon them in their hour of trial. Nebuchadnezzar stared in disbelief as miraculously he saw them walking around in the fire without any hurt or harm whatsoever. He even shouted to his advisors that he saw four walking around in the flames and the fourth one looked like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't imagining things either. He had been allowed to see with his own eyes that God takes care of his own people. God with the three Hebrews in the flames. God was with the three Hebrews in the, in the flames. He is always with those who are persecuted for their disobedience, for obedience to God. The fire didn't hurt those who were loyal to their God, but had only burned the ropes that bound them, so also in the last days. God will deliver his people from even the persecution of spiritual end time Babylon. What an incredible God! No wonder John saw many who decided to love and follow him. Notice how their triumphant victory is described. Revelation 15, 2. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having the hearts of God. Revelation 15 too. Do you want to be in that group? Can't you see that the God of the Bible is someone you can trust and love and choose to obey? He has already loved you. He has already died for you. He has eternal plans for a loving, trusting, incredible relationship with you, my friend. And He is calling you today to His children who may still be in Babylon, a counterfeit system of Christian worship. He has a special invitation. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. Unless you receive the plagues, Revelation 18, 4. It may appear 
to cost something to follow God. But Jesus promises to be with you. He promises to deliver you. He simply asks you to choose who will you trust and follow. And he's demonstrated that he is trustworthy. He showed you the greatest definition of what love is when he accepted your justice in order that he might extend to you his mercy. The warning in scripture about the mark of the beast isn't so much about false worship as it is a reminder for us of the true worship. And Jesus is worthy of our worship. He who willingly carried your sins to the cross and paid your ransom from sin and Satan invites you to make a choice today. Won't you follow him, my friend? Won't you choose to trust his word by keeping his commandments over the traditions and urgings of men? God, through his Holy Spirit, has been speaking to you in these presentations. He is making an urgent call to a dying world to get ready for Jesus' coming. We have seen in this presentation that another image, another test of loyalty on penalty of death is coming. But if there's anything that is clear in these prophecies, it is that there will again be men and women like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who will fearlessly and faithfully stand for the Savior they love. God will point to them as evidence that not everyone has bowed to worship the spiritual confusion of the devil's deceptions. He will say, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. I want to be with that group of people. What about you, my friend? Do you want to be among those found worshiping the Savior when he returns? Do you love the one who first loved you? Have you accepted his death in your place? His forgiveness for your sins? And do you know him as your Savior, your friend? Do you love and trust him enough to say, Yes, Jesus, I want to obey you and worship you because you alone are worthy of the worship of my heart. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we worship you, Lord. We obey you. We glorify you for saving us, for forgiving us from all our sins, for cleansing us from all our unrighteousness, and for the plan to save everyone that wants to be saved. We ask that you help us understand gospel, the rule of the salvation, how you died for us. Help us to share it to others. Thank you for saving us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.